Thank you so much, Professor. So, I mean, today top, uh, today uh, study topic is about the learning context uh, and it affects on the second language acquisitions. So, for my part, um, I will talk about the, the articles uh, that today we read and it's specified the context that we are looking at is study abroad. Study abroad as a learning context. So you mean it means that when you learn the second language and you go study, no matter how uh, how long does it take, you just immerse yourself in that social cultural context and whether it will affect um, on your language development or also you know affect the benefit. It means it also affect your attitude when you learn it, your motivations or maybe some negative emotion attached to it. Like for example, when you study abroad, you will feel more anxious and demotivated to learn a language or to assimilate into um, that learning context. So we will talk about some issue that study abroad in general raises for second language le learners. Uh, So I hope it's Valentine's Day. I hope to make it pink. But last time professor said that I need to reduce the number of colors on my slide. So you can see that I oh, use black and white black. today. I didn't <laughs> well, um, I have the discussion question to start our discussions today. And it again, it will be more like a discussion based um, part. So. Can you rank the following factors? And again, we talk about these factors from a social psychological perspective rather than linguistic perspective, which we have covered in the first part of the class. So in this paper, it more about uh, effective factors and other peripheral factors that affect learning in a context. So I have three factors that the paper mentions and I want you to rank the following factors according to you in terms of most influence on student success while studying abroad uh, when they immerse themselves in a second language learning context to the least important and the list factors that will influence their success. If you're not happy with the three factors that um, were presented in the paper, any other factors you want to add? Okay, so everyone, I give you like two minutes to think about that and then please put your answer in the chat. Okay, so two minutes start. All right, so ideally, there's an assumption that if I learn English, for example, it's best for me 
to go and immerse myself in a, uh, in the target culture, for example, go to the United States and then stay there and study and learn to communicate with uh, the native speakers. So my linguistic competence will improve. Um, so that is the assumption, but there are some factors that may influence my success. And please, uh, uh, everyone, please contribute your opinion in your chat box right now. So I would ask, um, yeah, so you can see from the your own answers that you rank it differently. Some people say that is the motivation that is the most influence, but some other may think that is will be the willingness uh, to communicate and the commitment. Um, so, but most of us, the majority seems to agree that motivation is really important then. Um, Yingru, can you uh, share with us what you think is why you choose motivation is the most important and the anxiety is something that not really will affect uh, the student's success? Um, because if you have a the motivation to communicate and uh, when you are studying abroad, I think you can overcome the anxiety and you also have the willingness to communicate in a target language. That is why I think motivation is the most important thing. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and on here, you are saying actually uh, you don't really align with the three uh, factors, separate factors. Um, and you say that their immediate environment uh, and people they interact with. Can you elaborate a little bit on your answer? Oh, no, I didn't mean that these um, factors don't play uh, a part. But it just said, I was just like, I was just answering the last part where it said um, any other factors you want to add. So, um, so in your I opinion, think, you think these three can still be treated as separate variables? They do not sure, relate know, to each other. Sure, I don't know how they're co how they, I don't know how they're related. Mm. Uh, I'm sure, um, yeah. But if you can add other factor, you will add the environment um, that they may have differences in the immediate environment they interact and who they interact in different study abroad programs. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, like, who do they hang out with and who do they interact with the most? Um, do we mean, right, L2 learning context? So you would think that they have to speak in L2 as much as they can while they're being, you know, while they're abroad studying the language, but oftentimes they're sort of stuck with their fellow students who speak the same L1 as them. Uh, maybe not, on, not in all cases, but often. And if you just choose to do so, I guess, you know, then the whole time you're there, you'll be just speaking in your L1 rather than L2 and then just getting out, meeting new people. Um, I mean, as a ESL teacher, I've seen that a lot. Mm. Uh, and also I've been ESL, you know, student uh, long, you know, long time ago. And uh, you actually had to like make conscious effort to not speak in L1 and to hang out with your, you know, people from your country. So that you can speak L2 more and that you can practice it more and stuff like that. And of course, all these A, B, C, the anxiety and motivation, all they all play a part, of course, in your success. Yes. So for the research purpose, they kind of separate and define each variable differently. So we will look into that. But definitely there are, are because we're talking about the learning context here, right? So it's a very complex context and it's very simply simplistic if we just uh, need compartmentalize it into uh, measurable variables. And what Onhi just listed out is that in addition to these three factors, definitely there are some certain factors that can be taken into account when we mean what we mean by second language learning context. So this is how they 
define the second language learner anxiety. So anxiety here has two types of anxiety. We're talking about the anxiety to speak. So it's really like oral communications, um, willingness and dedication to uh, and commit to talking with other people, including native speaker, especially when it comes to study abroad. And the second task is the anxiety during the learning process, more or less likely in the classroom. For example, on he said that during the study abroad, students can also participate in English as a second language classes. So they definitely have some learning anxiety when attend those class. For the anxiety to communicate, it can include, you know, their time outside of their class. And, you know, who do they mingle with? Do they, you know, intend to do it with, uh, communicate with native speakers using second language? Otherwise, they will uh, use the first language and stay with their own international student group. So those are the uh, two different aspects of uh, learner anxiety. So in this, uh, chart, you can also see that with the anxiety, we have communication anxiety and how it relates to the willingness to communicate. Well, they say that the willingness to communicate include the anxiety level when you communicate plus your confidence about yourself. So it's your self-perceived confidence in terms of your communication competence. It means how much uh, you know about English and use English with the communicative functions in a context. Those two together will comprise together, will make, will construct, help to construct their, uh, the idea of willingness to communicate. And the willingness to communicate will decide how often you communicate. So this is what yeah, uh, Yashima second language communication model is uh, emphasized. He said that merely having motivation doesn't seem to be sufficient for an individual being willing to communicate. He or she needs to have high level of confidence in his or her second language communicative competence and low communication anxiety. So these, again, these two elements will make up the willingness to communicate. So how do they know that? When it comes to the second tab of second learning, um, second language learning anxiety, they define that, they de devise a questionnaire and they define that um, they can measure it on the scale, like Likert scale from really, really anxious to the least anxious feeling when it comes to learning and communicate using the second language. And the anxiety can come from three different sources, communication appreh apprehensions, Test anxiety. So when it comes to assessment, it can also cause the student to feel anxious. And then fear of negative evaluation. It means the feedback and the responses of uh, the teacher, the instructor gonna also affect their learning anxiety. And the learning anxiety plus the communication anxiety will together with the perceived confidence will affect their willingness to communicate. So talking about this negative feeling, why do students in study abroad program have the second language learning anxiety, you think? Because it seems like they are in a very ideal situation where they can interact with native speakers and where they can immerse in exciting events to use the language, to go shopping, for example, and talk in English, but why do they um, demonstrate some anxious feelings? Also from your experience, what do you think? 
Yeah, anxiety is a major problem for second language learners because the apprehension is real. Take for instance, if one says a, a word in the in the target language and maybe for one reason or the other doesn't get it, and the feedback he gets maybe from his classmates or from those around him um, might make him set, might send him back like too many seats back in the in the classroom. So um, I think I shared with you sometime about the idea of, of uh, people being uh, maligned because of their accent when they speak, especially those of us that came to you, that that are here. Um, some may ask you or say, "Wow, uh, uh, you, do you really mean this? Do you really mean that? That your accent is different?" So that is also a factor that I think we should also factor in this whole discourse and conversation. You know, yeah. So these yes. all, all happen in the realm of anxiety. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Uzo. Um, his answer is like really correct because even though they are in a study approach and they're very excited about this interactional change opportunity, but they have either limited linguistic competence and also the cultural differences. Like even they know the expression, but if they are in an actual emergent, actual situational context and they just select the inappropriate sentence, for example, I remember like, uh, in the book, they say, how are you? And they taught me, you know, I'm fine, thank you, and you, right? But when I come to the United States, if I say, I'm fine, thank you, and you, that's not the natural way to say it. So the cultural differences as well also be a factors that we call anxiety for students who even seems to be in an ideal context for second language learning. Now, the next question that we can also ask is, how exactly does linguistic competence reflect student learning anxiety doing study abroad? In other words, do you think that study abroad will have different effect depending on whether you or have the low linguistic competence, you're a beginner, compared with when you are an advanced learner, for example? So how the linguistic competence will affect the anxiety in study abroad? What do you think? Yes, it is a discussion. Anyone you can uh, unmute and then tell, tell me what you think. Um, I think um, that the higher the linguistic competence of the student, that the lower their anxiety will be. Um, because if you're, you're more confident in what you're saying, um, then you're less likely to be anxious about using the less familiar language to communicate. Yeah, do you agree? Because I think people in this class um, will, you know, if you are from the first different first language background, but if you consider you are doing study abroad right now and you are an advanced English language learner, you will feel less anxiety. And that is will bring a positive experience. I think Rachel is right that the research showed that study abroad will help decrease the learning anxiety in all level. But for the advanced learner, they kind of you know, will have lower anxiety. So basically the, the decrease is not that much, you know, but for beginner and intermediate level, when they come, they may have a very high anxiety level and throughout the time when they're doing study abroad, their anxiety score will decrease. And we can see that that decrease is very significant. So the conclusion here is that actually the study abroad is really helpful for beginner and intermediate levels learners specifically, because it's helped them to ease their anxiety across the time they spend in a study abroad program. So that's a good point. Now, the next question when it comes to learning anxiety, do you think that a longer study abroad program will mean a lower score in the foreign language uh, uh, anxiety.
Um, I think based on based on what the article said, um, that a longer study abroad program will mean a lower anxiety score. Um, because as you get more exposure and practice to the target language, you become more confident and less anxious. Um, but I think it also, um, it might like circle back around at some point, like the longer you stay there. Um, because I know like sometimes the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. So um, you might get, um, you might be anxious and then less anxious, more confident, and then more anxious again because um, because you learn more and then you learn that you need to learn more. Yeah, it seems like a vicious cycle. I don't know if, uh, if uh, friends in this class agree or not, but definitely there is the saying that on, on the one hand, there's study saying the lane of stage um, for example, two, three, four weeks. And you can see that for this study, the study program usually just for weeks, right? They don't really report the study that, you know, for a long time, for example, four years, when we have to study abroad to complete a degree, for example. So with the length of just in terms of weeks, they actually do not find any relationship with the degrees, um, patterns in the anxiety score so it does really matter right but on the other hand some other study really report that in specific context of study abroad programs actually the longer you stay the the lower the score of anxiety is so it's really right now it a mixed pictures uh when it comes to a conclusion right so that is about the anxiety aspect of the learning context. So we see that there's not really consensus when it's come to whether, uh, how long it takes to study a prop will affect anxiety or the proficiency level is clearer that it would be more benefit in terms of lowering anxiety if you are from a lower uh, proficiency level. Now, when it comes to the second factors of the contextual uh, variables, the second language willingness to communicate um, how it will affect the second learn the second language learning in study abroad program. So the the willingness to communicate is defined by your readiness to enter into a discourse at a particular time with a specific person using second language. That is the definition of willingness to communicate. So do you agree or disagree with the statement that students capable of communication inside the classroom, but these students may not be amenable to do so outside the classrooms? Do you think that is uh, you would agree with that? If yes, why so? Why, what happened to their willingness to communicate outside the classroom? Devindi, what do you think? I agree with the statement. So maybe sometimes students are familiar with their classmates and they are willing to communicate with them. And when it comes to outside the classroom, you meet native speakers and sometimes because of the language and also with the accent, it's hard to understand them. So I totally agree with this one. Yes. So... Actually, when the researchers look into, you know, what make up the willingness to communicate, they say that it's, it's actually a more complex uh, picture. So what I will put in the chat right now is actually this chart. And we will, you can look at this chart uh, and download it clearer. So basically they say that the willingness to communicate um, we'll have, we can be divided into six layers. And for every two layers, um, the complexity of the social cultural factor will be more serious and play uh, a stronger effect on their willingness to talk, to communicate. First of all, it can come to 
um, their own ability to know the language, the second language use, like they learn it in the classroom, but outside the classroom, how to apply that. So it's a pragmatic knowledge um, that can affect their willingness to talk. Another is um, they can also be in a situation. So how the situation, they evaluate the situation, how confident they, they feel themselves in that situation to talk. And also it can come from interpersonal motivation. It means the relationship between them and the other person. Intergroup motivation, do they feel that they belong to that group? Um, and then when it's become broader, not just only a specific situation, but you can also have you know, a larger context of the social context. Uh, where it comes to the intergroup climate or intergroup attitude. For example, you perceive that, uh, oh, American speakers tend to be more aggressive than the people in my culture. So I perceive them as like, more like, mm, I, I, I'm very afraid to interrupt them, for example. So it's also affective cognitive context that you also use to evaluate the situation. And and so these six layers, uh, when it comes to a person um, opinion about their own willingness to talk, it can reflect um, something related to the factor that make up these six layers. So on layer one, you can see there are only one factor of second language use, but for example, layer three is situated uh, antecedent. It will be your it will include a person desire to communicate with a specific person. And also it include that person all self confidence to communicate as well. So these make up the whole pyramid. It means that uh, we just only not just only have one reason when it comes to whether we're willing or we're not willing to speak, but usually it's a complex, um, it's a combination of individual factors that make up the layer here. So let's just do a little bit um, assignment. So on the screen, you will see that this is a report from a student and this uh, study has been included in the, was mentioned in our paper. But I just pick out um, evidence from the data that, uh, that was uh, in the study. So this person is talking about why she willing or not willing to communicate. What I want us to do now is to look at the evidence. And then you look at the framework of the theoretical factors that you see in the pyramid. And under like whether you can see any evidence and that evidence you think belong to what factors mentioned in the pyramid, okay? So Ying Kong, can you please help me uh, to read the evidence on the screen? Sure. I am an introvert, you know, in my mother language, I am not open to the strangers. So I not so be more open to talk with other people, especially in English. I feel speaking with foreigner in English, I feel so anxious, not very confident. And I think in my mind, I have to choose the word and I have to make the sentence more grammatically. So sometimes still some pause and hesitation. As Helen cited in McLean, Tyre and Wang, 2021. Yes, thank you, Ying Kong. Right, so I will give everyone two minutes to look at this evidence and then you can compare with the pyramid to see, you know, for example, any specific words or indication or evidence you find in this interview transcript that reflect the factors in the pyramid. Okay, so two minutes start.
All right, Rachel, you want to try? Which factors affect him who is a Vietnamese student study abroad in Canada? Um, that is the background in the study. What do you think is the factors that affect her willingness to communicate um, um, in this um, evidence that she says? Right. Um, so I I looked at the the numbers uh, in the the chart and I kind of associated them with some of the words that popped up in the paragraph and I put those in the chat. Um, so when the student says that they're an introvert and they don't uh, really talk uh, with people, that was uh, number twelve. So personality. Um, number 10 communicative competence so like if they don't talk very much with other people then they might not be confident in their ability to talk with other people um, and then i said it was um number four as well is that um they don't um have com um communicative communicative self-confidence um so they they aren't confident that they will uh uh talk or use the correct words um, in uh, conversation. Um, and then when they said not open to strangers, um, I said number five, so interpersonal motivation and number nine, social situation. Um, those are the, the effective cognitive context and motivational propensities. Um, they don't want to talk with strangers, so they don't have that interpersonal motivation. Um, and because they want to avoid social situations, um, they don't have the effective cognitive context. Um, and then they said uh, they were anxious and not confident. Uh, so I said, again, that was number four. And they said they were especially not confident in English. So that was uh, number seven. So those are uh, situated antecedents and motivational propensities is what I, <laughs> what I identified. Rachel, that's really a lot within two minutes you have the uh, you have the ability to, to to do to become a researcher in the future that's really <laughs> good well because we don't have enough time to really delve into the definition and of course you have to cross check it with another rater in terms of analyze this but it's a really great analysis so in the study they reported that he demonstrated more like layer five and layer six, like you're saying, you touch on, uh, especially her communicative competence and her comfort level in a social situation. And also as layer six is definitely that uh, her willingness to communicate is affected by her personality. But of course, uh, in addition to the major roles and factors in the pyramid, there also be some salient and underlying um, mechanism that can demonstrate other factors in other layers as well. And your job is really need to cite the evidence from the participant in order to illustrate and prove your point. So that's really good. Now let's try again with another um, with another participant. And this time it's Lin. And Lin is an um, advanced learner. So he is like a beginner, um, but Lin is an advanced learner. So also use the chart. Um, you can also see how you can characterize her willingness to communicate. Yingru, would you help me uh, by helping me with uh, the evidence on the screen? Okay. Uh, I'm not confident about my language. When I take the art gallery summer job, I feel confused about what I have learned. And when they talk to each other, maybe their accent, or maybe their culture, or maybe the words they use are different from what I learned. When they are talking, 80% of the time, I can understand what they are talking about, but sometimes I react not quickly. And if I respond to the teacher's question, it's a little bit hard for me. I was like, I need to translate into English. Okay, so let's just delve into this uh, evidence and look at the chart that we just um, discussed and tell me what do you think, okay? So two minutes start.
Okay, can I have a volunteer? Ying Gong, maybe I would like to hear what you think. Uh, all right. Um, maybe I think the, the advanced learners that is uh, have uh, more factors on the fifth layers that is intergroup attitude because uh, that is he mentioned about uh, uh, he can understand eighty percent of uh, what they are talking about, uh, but sometimes uh, their kind of expressions uh, related to culture or something else maybe there's uh, cause some kind of difficulties. And also there are some social situations uh, factors. And uh, at the end of the, uh, I mean, the dialogue, uh, he also mentioned about uh, some difficulties uh, related with the communicative competence. So uh, most of them, I think, are belong to effective cognitive context, which is the fifth layers. Thank you. Yes, so with lower level in here in case, the first case more like layer five and six, but with the advanced case, it's more like exactly primarily layer five, more like how they perceive uh, their relationship with the intergroup, the membership in the new community, their attitudes, whether they feel judged by the native speakers. And that's what Rachel means a little bit at the beginning when she said, well, we are advanced learner, we know how to, um, we, we learn new things, but the more we learn, the more we may feel not ready to talk or anxious because we are afraid that we would, wouldn't know something, you know, and feel judged. Um, so, and then also, uh, also it will affect the, the self-confidence when um, she say that she feel confused. So basically she should be confident about her linguistic knowledge, but actually she, she say she feel confused about what I have learned. So the self-confidence in layer four uh, will also affect her willingness to communicate. So in this study, uh, when it come, in, in this study, when it come to um, the willingness to communicate, actually this pyramid has been used um, very famous and has been used in so many study. And what they do is they also interview uh, the participants and also see which layer that is reflected through the pyramid and whether it will demonstrate a positive emotion or negative emotions. Um, and they also have some additional comment or evidence that will not fall in any categories or maybe fall into the blurry um, categories that may come up or construct um, the new pyramid according to um, the context. For example, with this pyramid, if you apply to uh, studying abroad in Japanese culture, it would be different from that in uh, American culture, for example. Um, also, another factor is how this kind of willingness to communicate will span across the program. Like at the beginning, compared with to the end of the program, it also, you know, fluctuates. So it's not stable, uh, stabilized process, but it's more like a fluctuate and it can be a thing to change um, that the participant start to become adaptive or resistant to uh, the study abroad program. So in conclusions, uh, in terms of these factors, what does the research say? Uh, first, the series of studies on international posture show that positive attitude towards English uh, is so important. When you have a positive attitude towards the native speakers, it's easier for you and it's more willing for you uh, to talk and communicate with them during the study abroad. Second, personality seems to be also the key factors, whether you are an extroverted person or introverted person. However, it is noted that maybe you're an extroverted person by doing a study, a diagnostics test, but if you perceive yourself as an introverted, even you diagnose as an extroverted, it's another story, okay? So it's different than who you think you are 
person who you truly are through the testing. So that's kind of something we need to think about. The third thing that will affect the willingness to communicate is the teaching practices. So this is something inside the classroom. Uh, if you are inside the classroom, you're more willing to practice because you know that you are learning and nobody judge you uh, because you can make mistake and because it's, you feel protected uh, in that kind of special space. But outside, it, it, it may be a different context. However, study also show that during your study abroad, if your teaching practice is too harsh and really just focus on correcting mistakes, it will do more harm than benefits. And lastly, we talk about that it seems like the clear, the clearest change in lowering anxiety and also, you know, upgrade your, your improve your willingness to, to speak will be more clear and evident uh, amongst intermediate level group. So they show the clearest progress compared to other uh, level of language proficiency. Now we come to the last factors uh, when it comes to the success in the study abroad program is the student motivation uh, to learn and to use the second language. So how do we define motivation? And this uh, paper, there are different definitions out there, right? We learn um, motivation from the perspective of investment in the first part of the class. But other scholars also have different definition as well. And the paper that we read uh, rely on Georg Gehan uh, in uh, to 2018. And they say that motivations actually relies on how you make sense of yourself. And there are two ways that you can make sense of yourself. The first way is called ideal second language self. Um, Yingru, can you help me to uh, explain what ideal second language self is? Yeah, ideal second language self is related to the image one has of their future self as a second language user according to their own wishes. Yeah, so it's their, you know, their uh, self perceptions yeah, of what see. they wishes yeah. to become. Yeah, and the second one is called up to second language self. Um, Jing Kao, can you please help me with the definition? Okay, uh, outro, uh, outro, outro second language self is concerned with uh, attributes which the learner believes the outro possess in order to meet expectations and avoid negative outcomes according to external expectations. Right, so up to second language self would be, you know, maybe you are motivated because there are some external expectation, right? So in yourself, in your situation, do you think it's more like your own philosophy, your internal factors, your own wishes will decide your motivation or is more, is more like an external expectation will motivate you to learn? Let me give you an example. So I have two uh, scenario here to individual. Uh, can you tell me that individual maybe their motivation is affected by ideal or up to second language self? Okay, so two minutes for us to think about that. Han, we have like 10 minutes. Yes, Professor, I'm in very last slides now. Yeah. Yeah, because they they want to go to Valentine's Day. I know. <laughs> okay, then let's do it together then. Devendi, would you help me with the first case? Um, what do you think that this person um, is more like I do second self or ought to second self? I think it's ideal second language self. Mm, why do you think so? Uh, because they may imagine themselves speaking Japanese effortlessly so that what that person wants to do in the future after learning Japanese. 
Exactly. More like in their mindset, right? They position themselves in relation with other. And that is really their ideal self here that motivated them to study second language. How about the second case? Um, Tinkao, what do you think? Yeah, I think they um, we need to learn the second language because they are supposed to, they feel they're, uh, they are required to learn the second language. Exactly. So it's more like a career goals that make them opt to, right? It's opt to second language self. So in the paper, I just want to highlight that uh, the actual realities that a person face when they study abroad. Um, in the target context may be a practical way to help them recognize their current self more clearly. And such study abroad experience may facilitate their construct of their ideal self images vividly with relative ease. So what does it mean with this conclusion is that for study abroad learning context, the ideal self is more important and more highlighted than the up to second language self. Okay, and so we come to the last slide today that I have is the conclusion. So when we're talking about the topic of learning context, and let's just pick one um, context that study abroad, what kind of issues that study abroad specifically uh, raise, it's revealed to us that study abroad is a unique um, learning is context and unique opportunity for students to learn how to socialize and create new concepts in terms of social cultural encounters, right? But um, effective factors, there are many effective factors that can affect their success in study abroad and their engagement with that uh, contact in order to become a successful language learner. The most three prominent one is their anxiety, their willingness to communicate, um, level and then their motivation but it is a very complex construct they can overlap with each other and relate with each other depending on how we define the variables and i just showcased in previous slide second um the information in the study can be misleading if they just rely on the self-reported uh, transcript or interview from the student so a mixed method, like for example, classroom observation or linguistic discourse analysis would be more um, reliable and can give a holistic picture. Uh, the third one that we need to know is um, we talk about linguistic gains, like how we study abroad can improve our grammar knowledge, for example. But it's also very important to pay attention to other variable that may affect that linguistic gain, for example, the motivation or the anxiety level. The third thing that we can learn from uh, that the, the paper highlighted is that teacher can use um, the video recording or observation to analyze and pay more attention to student effective factors. Uh, for example, in which part of activity they very interested in and which one they start to lose uh, interest and create more anxiety. And the most important thing is no matter what learning context that you expose your student to or try to create emotional, positive emotions are so important. So the activity should be engaging and should create, uh, like Uzo say, if it is a negative loop of feedback, it's very harmful. So it should be a positive emotional learning experience. Thank you so much uh, for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you, Han. Thank you for this detailed and interesting approach to this article, you know, and the, you really try to kind of uh, reveal all the important points that were in the article. So, all right.